It was the largest meeting in the history of the world. Not the largest gathering, but the largest meeting, with about 2,500 people speaking, debating, making amendments, and voting. Give up? The biggest meeting in the history of the world was the Second Vatican Council, held in Rome from 1962 to 1965. If you're Catholic, and even if you're not, you've probably heard about the Second Vatican Council, also known as Vatican II, because back in 1869, there had been an earlier council held at the Vatican in Rome. So what's the big deal? Why do people keep talking about Vatican II, a meeting held over 50 years ago? Ancient history, right? Well, let's begin at the beginning. Vatican II was an ecumenical or global council, that is, a meeting of all the Catholic bishops from all around the world, including the Pope. It was the 21st such council. The first was held in Nicaea in the year 325 AD. That's where we got the Nicene Creed we profess at baptism and say at Mass. In the Catholic tradition, these councils are the supreme authority. Any decisions made at a council are binding on the whole church. There is no higher authority that can reverse or change the decisions of a council. Vatican II was in many ways quite different from the first 20 councils of the Catholic Church. In the past, councils were usually called to accomplish two things, to make new church laws and or to condemn false teachings and convict false teachers. But at Vatican II, no new laws were passed and no one was condemned, no heretic was excommunicated. A second way this council was different, it was truly global. At the Council of Trent back in the 16th century, only 200 bishops were present, almost all of them from Europe. At the First Vatican Council in the 19th century, about 500 bishops were there, again, most from Europe. But at Vatican II, there were over 2,200 bishops from 116 different nations, many from Asia and Africa. The Council, like the Church itself, was truly multicultural. Third, the Pope did something that was unheard of at Vatican II. He invited leaders of Protestant churches, Greek Orthodox churches, the Jewish community, women, married people, and others to observe the proceedings of the council. They couldn't vote, but they could and did rub shoulders with the bishops and express their views and concerns to them. They were not without influence, in other words. Finally, this was the first time the Catholic Church held a council that was open to the media. The council received extensive news coverage. There was even an inside source leaking information to the New Yorker magazine under the false name Xavier Wren. He was actually a priest named Francis Xavier Murphy. Xavier was his middle name and Wren was his mother's maiden name. Up until this time, many Catholics assumed that the leaders of the church were always in agreement, always on the same page. The church seemed like some monolith that always spoke with one voice. The press coverage of the council made it clear to Catholics and to the general public that this was not necessarily so. At the council, there was a majority and a minority. Most of the decisions made received about 80 to 85 percent of the vote, but there was an active minority who resisted. About 80 percent of the bishops were more progressive and voted for change, but a minority consistently voted against any change in the church. The leaders of the progressive majority included Cardinal Sunens of Belgium and Cardinal Bea of Germany. The leaders of the conservative minority were Cardinal Ottaviani and Cardinal Laraona, both Vatican officials. Here's a little timeline for the Second Vatican Council. Preparation. In 1959, Pope John XXIII announces his decision to hold a council. He believes the church needs updating, a giornamento, and has no specific agenda. He instructs Vatican authorities to send out letters to all bishops and leaders of religious orders around the world. The Vatican receives 2,000 responses, about 8,000 pages of text. These suggestions are sorted out and arranged into about 70 documents for the bishops to read, debate, and vote on. First session. The bishops and all other participants gather at the Vatican in Rome on October 11, 1962, to hear Pope John XXIII give his opening message. He tells the bishops he hopes the documents they produce will be positive, not negative and condemning. 
and warns that they not pay any attention to certain prophets of doom in their midst. He asks that they make any changes to church teaching and practice that are appropriate, taking modern research and forms of thought seriously. When the bishops realized they must deal with 70 documents that had been prepared by members of the minority working within the Vatican, they vote to form their own commissions, appoint their own heads of these commissions, and wait until the following year to discuss, debate, and decide on reforms and changes in the church. Just six months later, in June of 1963, Pope John XXIII dies of cancer. Now what? Is that the end of church reform, updating, and change? What would the next pope decide? It didn't take long to find out. Cardinal Giovanni Montini is elected pope and takes the name Pope Paul VI. He reconvenes the council the following September as scheduled, and the work continues. The second session of the council runs from September to December 1963, the third from September to November 1964, and the final session from September to December 1965. In the end, the Council produces 16 documents, four constitutions, nine decrees, and three declarations. What those documents contain would change the Catholic Church forever. So what changed? Here are six examples. First, before this Council, all Catholic worship was in Latin. When people went to Mass or received any of the sacraments, everything was in a foreign language. No one could participate, people just sat there passively. Even the readings from the Bible were in Latin. It was not uncommon for Catholics to say the rosary to themselves while the priest said Mass. One of the documents of Vatican II said that Catholics should worship in their own native languages, incorporating their own cultural traditions and that there should be as much participation in the sacraments, including Mass, as possible. The liturgy is something we all do together, in other words, not something the priest does while everyone else watches. Second, there were no lay ministries in the Catholic Church before Vatican II. Lay people, people not ordained as priests or bishops, had no role in the liturgy at all. There were no lectors reading and no Eucharistic ministers giving out communion. There were no lay campus ministers or hospital chaplains or directors of religious education. Very few lay people had degrees in theology or canon law. The documents approved at Vatican II made it clear that every Christian, by virtue of her or his baptism, has an active role to play in the life of the church. We each have gifts and talents to share with the rest of the community. We each have our own ministry of service. Third, before the council, Catholics were taught to avoid Protestants. Protestants were thought to be dangerous heretics. Any Protestant who wanted to become a Catholic had to be rebaptized. No Catholic was allowed to go to a Protestant wedding or prayer service, and any Catholic wanting to go to a non-Catholic college was supposed to get special permission from her or his bishop. Now all of that has changed. The bishops of the Second Vatican Council taught that Catholics should develop good, cordial relationships with non-Catholic Christians, seeing them not as heretics, but as separated brothers and sisters. The Church now recognizes the validity of all baptisms in every Christian denomination, and Catholics are encouraged to participate in prayer with Protestants, at weddings, at ecumenical prayer services, and the like. Even the Pope now freely and openly prays with non-Catholic Christians. Fourth, before the Council, all Jewish people everywhere were blamed for the death of Jesus Christ. Jews were Christ killers and were brutally persecuted, often by Catholics and other Christians. The Nazi Holocaust of the 20th century demonstrated where that kind of hate leads. The Second Vatican Council's documents make it clear that in Catholic teaching, the Jews are still God's chosen people because God does not make a covenant with a people only to break it. It also teaches that the Jews cannot be blamed for the death of Jesus. The blame for Jesus' death falls on a few first century Jewish and Roman leaders. It is ridiculous to blame an entire race for the actions of a few. Recent popes have called anti-Semitism a sin and have not only apologized for past crimes and sins committed by Catholics against Jews, but have traveled to Jerusalem and to many synagogues to pray with and for the Jewish people. A fifth example, 
Prior to the Second Vatican Council, it was thought that, quote, error has no rights, unquote. So anyone teaching anything contrary to Catholic teaching has no rights. That means government should protect and promote Catholics and their church, but no one else. There should be no separation of church and state. The state exists to protect the truth, Catholicism, and not error, everything but Catholicism. But the Council's documents make it clear that every human being is made in the image of God and so has an infinite dignity and worth. Because every human person has this dignity, every person's conscience must be respected. I cannot honestly claim that I respect your dignity as a human person if I am forcing you to violate your conscience, your deepest beliefs. And that obviously includes your religious convictions. This leads to the conclusion that governments have a duty to protect religious liberty and should not be supporting one religion over another. This is a dramatic change for a church which, at one time in the not-too-distant past, was condemning heretics and sometimes urging Catholic governments to burn them at the stake. The slogan, Era Has No Rights, by the way, is a silly thing to say. People have rights, not things. A sixth and final example before Vatican II, it was assumed that anyone practicing a non-Christian religion was a godless pagan. Hindus, Buddhists, Taoists, Confucians, and even Muslims, all were thought to be damned. It would have been unthinkable, for example, to teach world religions in a Catholic school prior to Vatican II. But in one of its documents, the Council Fathers said, quote, The Catholic Church rejects nothing that is true and holy in these non-Christian religions, unquote, and called for an open and honest dialogue between Catholics and non-Christians. In fact, recent popes have participated in the World Day of Prayer for Peace, a gathering of as many as 160 leaders representing 32 Christian organizations and 11 non-Christian world religions. This would have been unthinkable before the Second Vatican Council. So, worship in the vernacular with as much participation as possible. Lay ministry in the church. Protestants are not heretics, but separated brothers and sisters in Christ. The sinfulness of anti-Semitism. Human dignity, freedom of conscience, religious liberty. Openness to Islam, Buddhism, and all non-Christian religions. And these six are just a sample. Just a few examples of the dozens of reforms and changes brought about by the Second Vatican Council. Which is why even today, 50 years later, it is so significant. Think about it. The world's largest organization, with over a billion members, held the biggest meeting in the history of the world and made monumental decisions that have changed the course of human history. Check it out. There's a lot more to know about the Council. We've only just scratched the surface in this presentation.